Hey guys, Brett Weiss here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Tales from a Retro Gamer. As many of you know, I recently finished my 11th book, The NES Omnibus, Volume 1, which will be out late this year. But what many of you don't know is my very first attempt at getting a book published was a massive failure. Now, I say that it was a failure, but I did learn a lot along the way, and it was an interesting experience. And it was going to be called Captain Cartridge Rates the Games. That was just sort of a working title. But ultimately, I decided on Captain Cartridge Reviews the Games, a super guide to the world of 16-bit entertainment. Now, this book I had sort of been kicking around in my head since the early 90s. Well, I got serious about it in 1994. This is when my wife and I lived in, a par in an apartment and hadn't been married too long. And um, my big plan was to have this massive book where I reviewed a bunch of Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo games. Because in 1994, these systems were still going. Now, it was sort of relatively late, pretty late in the life of these consoles. Um, and the PlayStation and N Nintendo 64 were going to be coming out, um, you know, the next year and everything. But... These, na these games were still new in stores, and I figured, hey, this is, these are big, popular systems, and this book would be relevant for a long time because, um, you know, the Super Nintendo and the Genesis, you know, two of the biggest, most important, best consoles ever. And so I was working, I was going to Blockbuster, and um, anyway, getting ahead of myself a little bit. Before I get into all the inner workings of working on these books and what I was doing and how I was going about it. I'm going to give you a real brief history of just why I got into writing reference books to begin with. Now, I grew up reading reference books. I absolutely loved Leonard Maltin's film guides, and that was the big inspiration for my classic home video game series. Now, here's the only one I have right now. I don't know what happened to my earlier editions. I guess I got rid of them as I, as I got newer ones. As you can see, this is the 2000 edition. Super thick book, tons and tons of little capsule movie reviews. And with my, <clears throat> excuse me, my classic home video game series, that's what I had in mind, you know, just sort of a video game version of these, of Leonard Maltin's books. And so I really love, just look at that, no pictures or anything, just tons of text before, you know, IMDb and all that. This is what we relied on. Uh, to get our, you know, just rough idea of, well, I like this movie or not, uh, maybe what is it about, you know, just the rough plot and all that kind of stuff, and just to, you know, the year it came out and that kind of thing. So I grew up reading that. I grew up reading my parents' encyclopedia sets, and my favorite was the Guinness Book of World Records. I absolutely love the Guinness Books of, of World Records. Um, who can forget, you know, these images? If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you probably remember some of these striking images. Um, before the internet, you know, to get our weird, we went to Ripley's Believe It or Not in the Guinness Book of World's Records. And who can remember, who can't forget, um, or who could forget, you know, the world's tallest man, Robert Wadlow, and just him towering over the people he's standing by. And the McGuire twins, the world's heaviest twins on the motorcycles, very iconic photos. Just remember all kinds of, of just striking imagery and interesting and unusual facts from the Guinness Book of World Records. Love that book. And so it would only, uh, you know, growing up reading these um, books, uh, it just, it makes sense that I would go on to write reference books about one of my favorite subjects, video games. Now, I also grew up reading magazines, pop culture magazines, so it makes sense. You know, I've always been into pop culture. Very briefly, I want to show you just a couple of issues of these magazines I grew up reading. Many of you remember Dynamite Magazine. I would get through uh, Scholastic uh, Book Club. My mom would let me get three things each month, and I would, I would get uh, typically get an issue of Dynamite Magazine. I absolutely loved it, and uh, gotta love this Battlestar Galactica cover. And I would get two books, and or I might get a, a copy of Bananas Magazine. You gotta love that. Where else can you get Dolly Parton and Superman on the cover of the same magazine? And this is really cool. The Beatles, who even in the early 80s were considered uh, pretty old school. 
and Pizzazz Magazine, published by Marvel Comics. This is my favorite cover. Absolutely love that. Gorgeous. What a great band. And, of course, there was a Star Wars cover of Pizzazz Magazine. These were excellent. They covered all kinds of topics. Video games, records, music, movies, um, all that kind of stuff. Just love those magazines. So all these things helped influence me to start writing uh, books about uh, video games. Anyway, let's get to my super failed book experiment. The, the time I tried to write and get a book published and how that happened and, and the result. Now, um, like I said, this book was going to be called Captain Cartridge Reviews the Games, A Super Guide to the World of 16-Bit Entertainment. And um, I just, and I was also really influenced by Roger Ebert, the late, great Roger Ebert, who did film reviews, and he used a four-star system. So my book was not only going to have like a, like a synopsis, capsule synopsis slash review, I was also going to have a star system, four stars, just like Roger Ebert. And so what I started doing... I started renting tons of games at Blockbuster, Super Nintendo, and Genesis games. Now, I also was buying these games. Like at Funko Land, certain titles were super cheap. Blockbuster, at this point, they were getting rid of some of their Genesis and Super Nintendo games. Some of the ones that, you know, weren't renting so hotly anymore, that were, you know, just gathering dust on the shelves. I was buying them. So, uh... I was, what I would do, the way I was able to afford this, I would buy all these games, you know, I would rent a bunch of them, but I would buy a bunch too, because I knew of some pawn shops that would buy them back for me for the same, and sometimes even a little bit more. So I would, I was able to buy some of these Genesis and Super Nintendo games for, you know, two, three, four, five bucks a piece, and then I would sell them back to the pawn shops, certain pawn shops I knew of that were still paying five dollars a piece for Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis games. I was also borrowing games, and um, I was, you know, I had access to lots and lots of Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo games, and I was working on this book in my shared, and my wife and I also, we had a two-bedroom apartment, and we had our major, you know, our main, not major, our main master bedroom, and then we also had the secondary bedroom, which, you know, a lot of people use as an office or a guest room or whatever. We had it for a shared office, so half of it was had her stuff, you know, and uh, maybe the Longhorns or Shakespeare. She's a school teacher, my wife Carice, and my half would have all my pop culture stuff and my video games and movies and all that. And also, we both shared a Macintosh computer, so I would work in there. I would play these games and I would sit down and write about them. It was a rather ambitious project at the time. My uh, goal was to review, um, you know have a sort of a capsule review for 400 Genesis games and 400 Super Nintendo games in the same book. And I was, I was hard at work on it. And I got to the point where I was looking for publishers. And in, in the mid-90s, early 90s, it was difficult to find a publisher for video game books. Now, there were a number of tips and tricks books on the market. And there were a few other books on the market, like Leonard Herman's classic uh, video game books, things like that. But there were hardly any, uh, relatively speaking, video game books on the market. Now you're seeing many, many, you know, just video game books all over the place, retro gaming books, books about modern games. There's big sections at bookstores, uh, you know, just about video games, books about video games. Well, in the early to mid-90s, uh, if you go to the bookstore looking for video game books, they're just mixed in with the pop culture books or, you know, just a few titles or whatever. So it was a much different thing, much harder to find a publisher to like video game books, you know, it's like they didn't even know what you were talking about. It was really hard to convince uh, a publisher um, to even look at a video game book, you know, at a manuscript for a video game book. But I did my darndest and I shot the, you know, publishers want to look at a sample of your book. They don't want the whole thing, which is fortunate because what if you wrote a whole book and you spent forever shopping it around and could never find a publisher. And back then, it was much harder to self-publish books. You know, today with, you know, Amazon CreateSpace and other services, it's pretty easy to self-publish a book. But in those days, I knew nothing about self-publishing a book, and it would have been a much bigger undertaking than it is today. So that, to self-publish a book, it wasn't even an option for me. That, that's just not something I wanted to even try. And ultimately, I could not find a publisher and I want to show you guys and talk to you guys about 
the process I went through. So I would, you know, several pages from this book that I had written up, I would send it off to uh, different publishers and I would send them some art, uh, you know, just what, um, you know, box scans and um, things like that, colorful, you know, just some of the best images I could find that would go in the book. And ultimately I could not find a publisher and I do still have some pages from the book and I have um, my rejection letter from Krauss or Krause, however you say it, publisher, publish, publications, K-R-A-U-S-E, Krauss. I've always called it Krauss. I've heard other people call it Krause. Anyway, that's the company that published the Comics Buyer's Guide at that time. And um, they wrote me a rejection letter. Now, in a minute, I'm going to read you a couple of reviews from Cat Captain Cartridge, uh, reviews of the games, uh, a pretty decent one. And then one that was just awful. My writing has come a long way since the early 90s. But I, uh, anyway, it was an earnest attempt to get a book published. <clears throat> and Krause Publications wrote me, Dear Brett, thank you for allowing Kraus Publications to consider the potential of your book proposal. Reviews have come back on your proposal, and unfortunately, it does not fit our needs at this time. I wish you the best in your writing ventures and trust you will submit to us any future product, projects. Sincerely, Deborah J. Falpel. And then a P.S. Thanks for calling today. Good luck and keep writing. Yes, I'm sure I called them and bugged them. I'm not super patient. And also, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I wanted to make sure they were looking at my manuscript. Anyway, so I wasn't able to get the book published, but I still have some pages. Um, and I have a cover sheet, a proposal for Captain Cartridge Reviews of the Games, a super guide to the world of 16-bit entertainment by Brett Weiss. So with my book proposal that I submitted to different publishers, I had like an introduction and the cover letter and everything. And I'm, you know, just emphasizing how popular video games are and that, um, you know, there's so many Genesis and Super Nintendo games and how prevalent they are. And I quote some magazines and things. And I try to give my case for a different kind of video game books. I say, 99% of the video game books in print consist of tips, tricks, and strate strategies to use while playing the games. And then I, I point out a couple of these books, and then I say, my book's going to be different. And I say, while these books have merit, Captain Cartridge Reviews of the Games will be unique because it will provide descriptions and critiques of video games. Almost unheard of in the early 90s to have a book of video game reviews. Very unusual. And then I tell them, you know, this book can be marketed through retail bookstores, toy stores, new and used video game and software stores, rental outlets, comic book stores, and book clubs. And I actually had plans for, f for future volumes, you know, later, you know, second edition or up updates or whatever. Subsequent editions of this book will include additional reviews for old games, for new releases, and for any new systems that rival the popularity of the Sega Genesis or Super Nintendo. So if this book had been published, who knows? I might have written a follow-up with PlayStation and Nintendo 64 games. Wow, wouldn't that have been something? Okay, and I also told the publisher resources I, I needed to complete this book. They want to know my plans and what, you know, I had available to me to complete this book. And I said, most of the games the author, referring myself into the third person, will review are already available to him through his massive collection and his networking with fellow gamers. And I said, the author will rent an additional 100 games at a cost of $4 each. I was just kind of boiling it down how I was getting access to these games. Even in the early 90s, I knew a lot of gamers that had, you know, pretty big collections. And I said, the manuscript will be completed nine months after the accept acceptance of the proposal. Yes, these books do take a long time to write. Now, I, um, I want to read you guys a couple of reviews. Uh, one that I considered, you know, pretty decent. And one that is just really, really bad. <laughs> and that you might kind of find funny. So my one that I think is pretty decent is for Super Pinball Behind the Mask. It was a pretty realistic Super Nintendo um, pinball game. And I probably overrated it a little bit, but it was during the time. You know, it was, it was a brand new game when I was reviewing this because it came out in 1994. And I say, pinball has always been a difficult game to convert to the video screen. There are two reasons for this. First of all, it is nearly impossible to simulate the random ball movement of a pinball machine. And secondly, in real pinball, you can give the machine a swift nudge or a firm shove to help after the course of the ball. 
In Super Pinball for the SNES, you can choose between a progress through three different play fields in what is easily the most realistic pinball game ever created for a home video game system. What sets this game apart from the rest is the fluid ball movement and the nudge button, which jostles the board and puts English on the ball to help you control it. Now, just as an aside, Pinball for the NES, which I was very familiar with, did not have a nudge button, so to me, Super Pinball was a big upgrade. Also, the flipper action, sound, and graphics are all convincing. This is the perfect game for the pinball purist, but a scrolling or multiplayer play field would have added to the enjoyment in general to the video game buying public. And then I had like a little bit of trivia uh, with each game and it's called Did You Know? Pinball machines debuted as a cheap form of entertainment during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Wow, thanks for that great bit of trivia, me. All right, that was decent, you know, for um, 1994, I guess. So here's one for the great Super Ghouls and Ghosts for the Super Nintendo. A terrible write-up. It begins awfully and it's just, it's just bad. And then I have a ridiculous uh, bit of trivia after it. So Super Girls and Ghosts. First, the good news, which gets a three and a half star rating, by the way. First, the good news. You are a dumb way to, in, to start a, a capsule review. First, the good news. You are Arthur, and you've just wed a beautiful woman. You've got your health, powerful armor, magic weapons, and a new castle with low interest rates. Was I trying to be funny? Now the bad news. A demon has just broken through your window and stolen Guinevere, your lovely young wife, and has taken her to the Phantom Zone. You must fight your way through eight quests filled with horrible monsters. Zomb horrible monsters? That's pretty lame descriptive. Zombies, evil spirits, and spawns of Satan to rescue the princess. Good luck. This is a very difficult game. Terrible write-up. Doesn't tell me what weapons. Really doesn't get me a, 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 just a... It doesn't paint a very colorful picture of the sort of atmosphere of any of this game. And then my bit of trivia is, did you know, the belief in ghosts was revived in the 19th century when spiritualism came into vogue? Thanks for that, me. Anyway, I go through here, and I've got stars, three and a half stars for rock and roll racing, two and a half stars for the tick, uh, zombies ate my neighbors, four stars. A great game, came out in 93 and 94, very, still very fresh, awesome game. Anyway, that was a couple of reviews uh, from the failed, never-to-be-published Cap Captain Cartridge Reviews of the Games. Now, I want to go just a little bit further here. I want to tell you my about the author, my um, biography at the time, which was much different than it is now. My biography in 1994. Brett Weiss is currently working as a receiving clerk and bookseller for Walden Books in Hearst, Texas. Prior to this, he maintained a 50% ownership of Fantastic Comics and Cards. That was the store I owned with my brother-in-law. Uh, to make a long story short, let's see, it talked about me being a manager for Lone Star Comics. Now, here's my video game biography at the time. A follower of the video game industry for 20 years, Brett has 12 video game systems and hundreds of video game cartridges. I have a lot more than that now, to say the least. Brett spends his days working at Walden Books and his nights and weekends reading books of all kinds, writing short stories and game reviews, and playing video games. Captain Cartridge Reviews the Games will be his first published work. Yeah, back in 94, I hadn't even had an article published yet, uh, much less a book. Now, I'd had letters published in fan magazines and in you know industry publications for comic books, but I had never had an actual published article, hadn't been paid for an article yet at this time. Anyway, that is the history of that, uh, my first failed attempt. Very briefly, I have a couple of Patreon questions from Pete Noel. Any of my patrons that are of the $8 um, tier or above can get two questions read on a video each month. Now, I have several patrons at the $8 and above mark. So far, Pete Noel is the only one that has sent in his two questions per month, so you guys, Submit the questions. I'll be happy to read them in an episode. Pete asks, what is your favorite side-scrolling shooter? Now, um, that's a great question. There are so many excellent ones to choose from, like Defender and Gradius and on and on and on. I boiled it down to two. A classic one, Scramble from the early 80s. It's a brilliant arcade shooter where you fly like through caverns and uh, over buildings and everything in outer space. 
just a phenomenal game where you're shooting straight ahead and you're dropping bombs and it's intense and you're, you know, there's narrow passageways and fuel is a factor. So it's really nerve wracking when you're about to run out of fuel and you could, ironically, you bomb fuel depot, uh, like fuel depots or whatever to, uh, to refuel. Love scramble. And then my other favorite is Einhander for the original PlayStation. Slightly hard to find game. It's starting to get, you know, it's gotten valuable over the years. Um, I haven't looked at it lately, but um, I got mine uh, from Funko Land when it was reasonably priced. Love this game, just phenomenal. A great outer space shooter with brilliant graphics for the time. Just a gorgeous game, intense. I love it. So that was his first question. Second is a, a bit more detailed, but just briefly, he asked me, in one of your videos regarding the Amico, you mentioned the second iteration of Atari in television and ColecoVision, and how each one, while there was a lot of consumer excitement, turned out to be rather disappointing for various reasons, if not outright commercial failures. Why do you think this is? So the Atari 2600 was followed by the 5200 and 7800. Uh, the 5200 had really fragile joysticks that were non-centering. That was part of the problem with that. And the Atari 7800 was trounced by the NES because the 7800 pretty much had mostly upgraded versions of games that were already on the 2600, while the NES was coming out with just amazing, mind-blowing games like Super Mario Brothers, Metroid, and Zelda. The ColecoVision was followed up by the Atom Computer, which was a big bust because it was so problematic. So bug-ridden, so many were returned, and in, instead of the super game module, which they should have done, which would have been, you know, just a much more powerful ColecoVision. And the Intellivision, the Intellivision 2, and the Intellivision 3 were just, you know, they played the same games as the original Intellivision. The true follow-up to these consoles never came out, and so that was, you know, long story there, but that's basically it in a nutshell. So thanks, Pete, for that. And thank you guys for liking this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. This has been a long video. Thanks for hanging in there, but it was a wacky time trying to get a video game book published uh, back in the early 90s, and I had a really good time sharing the story with you. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you later.